the doors to the netherworld and invite everyone in so that you can determine a culprit. Uh, that um, That is what caused the problem because something came through that um, perceived my mother to be uh, the weakest uh, which she was. My mom was oppressed by something in that house that was taking a tremendous toll on her. And that night I saw the dark side of existence. That night I saw um, something enter my mother that was not of this world, that spoke through her in a language that does not exist on this planet. And as she was howling and screaming, and begging for release, her body was was contorted into a ball to the extent that you would expect to hear her bones snapping. Oh um, the chair that she was in uh, levitated off the floor uh, approximately a foot or more. And then in a split second, she was tossed um, a good 20 feet from the middle of our uh, dining room into the center of our parlor. And when her head struck the floor, every single person that was present in that house thought they had just witnessed her death. It took oh. my father more than an hour to revive her. And as he was throwing Ed and Lorraine and their entourage out of the house, Ed approached me in the kitchen where I was crying and holding up my little sister, Cindy, because we had just witnessed this and we didn't know if mom was dead or alive. And he came into the kitchen and said, don't call the police. Don't call an ambulance. They did not want what? any official authorities at that house while they were there. Oh, yeah, fuck. that's the truth. Wow. Wow. Sorry to say. You know, and, no, the, and the, the truth thing, is the truth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, my mother spent a year and a half or two years of her life compiling a thick notebook with birth records, death records, all of her experiences, all of our experiences, sketches of all of the apparitions that we had seen in the house, the dates, the times. I mean, she chronicled everything that happened in that house and Lorraine Warren asked if she could borrow my mother's notebook and make copies of everything in it and even though my mother was very reluctant to part with it she trusted her enough to turn over that countless hours of work that went into that blue notebook and she never got it back Aww. And it was sold as part of the uh, case files to the studio. We'll never see it again. And my mother considered that the greatest loss of her life, that that was her legacy to her children that was stolen from her. Wow. And that's the truth. And I know it's difficult for people who are big fans of the Warrens to hear this. But they need to know it. You know, the, the truth isn't always tidy and, and nicely packaged with ribbon and bows. Sometimes right. the truth is dark and sinister and painful. Now, I don't think that Lorraine, uh, I think that Lorraine probably perceived that that item, that notebook, was not something that mom should keep in the house, that she perceived it as uh, somehow infiltrated by negative energy, you know, a haunted item or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but she promised my mother that she would give it back to her over and over again, one visit after another, over a year and a half. And my mother never saw it again. And that night, the night of the seance, some um, very precious things that my mother had found on that property that she had shown to the Warrens and had tucked away in the last front cabinet, the built-in china um, hutch in our in our dining room. Uh, and uh, she had them all in a little bag, including a plaque from a coffin and a porcelain doll's head and a beautiful uh, uh, cut glass 
uh, perfume bottle, you know, several items that she had found in the house. And that night they disappeared out of the house as well. And we've never seen them since, although it has been reported that each one of them uh, is under glass on display at the Warren Museum. People need to know this. I know wow. it's difficult. <clears throat> that 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 puts a new light in in a direction that uh I wasn't that I, it's kind of hard to explain, but uh that yeah, that kind of makes me feel really weird. Um, it really weird does about the Warrens. Well, you know, I think that they had good intentions. You know, I mean, even when I was with Lorraine um, in 2013, we had a very long, extensive conversation. Uh, actually, we had several over the course of that weekend. Uh, we were staying in the same hotel. Uh, you know, our rooms weren't far apart. We had opportunities to see each other, not only on the set, uh, not only at the studios at Warner Brothers and New Line, but also at the hotel. And um, she told me outright that um, neither she or Ed were prepared for what they encountered in our home and that both of them um, were over their heads from the moment they stepped across the threshold but they didn't realize it at the time. Uh, and essentially that was an admission that they had made mistakes. And the way that our relationship with them was so uh, abruptly severed the night of the seance when my father threw them out of the house using language that I wouldn't dare to repeat on your air. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, I'm not surprised that that incident didn't make it into their case files because it did not reflect well on them. Um, yes. And, you know, the thing that was most important to Lorraine was to make sure that The Conjuring and all the subsequent films portrayed her and her husband as a devout and loving couple uh, who were in the world uh, basically to explore the unknown but to, but to do as much good for their clients as they possibly could but their attempts to it to uh help our family backfired in a big way because they were dealing with forces that they had no control over and did not even comprehend um and so they were not able to help and in in fact the uh the energy that they brought into that house with them actually made matters worse. It complicated things. It stirred up the activity in the house. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I want to tell you, I know we've gone over our two hours, but I do want to tell you, um, you know, after my mother recovered from that traumatic incident, and thank God she has absolutely no, rem no memory of that night at all. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that. It's not something that I would ever want her to remember in the middle of the night and wake up frightened or terrified in her own bed alone. I would never. You know, I'm I'm so grateful that that she's blocked it. Um, but um, a few a couple of months later, uh, it was probably late October uh, of '74. My mom was not doing well. She was wasting away. She had lost a lot of weight. She wasn't eating properly. She was living on coffee and cigarettes. Um, it, it, she was just not a well woman. Um, it had had a, a dramatically negative impact on her, what had occurred. Um, and one night she came out of her room and it was late. It was like 1030 or 11 o'clock at night. And I had made a big pot of beef stew. Uh, Dad was away. I fed my sisters, got their homework done with them, got them all in bed. Um, and I was sitting in the parlor doing my own homework. Um, and I know it was uh, certainly mid to late October because we had the fireplace going. 
and I had been feeding wood into it all night to keep the chill down in the house because even in October in Rhode Island, it could get brutally cold. Um, Mom came out of her bedroom and she uh, asked me what I had made for dinner. Uh, she looked so sad, you know, she just looked wasted, uh, exhausted, beyond exhausted. And she'd been in bed all day long, just not well. Um, but she asked me what I made for dinner and I told her and she said she was hungry and I was delighted to put my homework aside and to walk the full length of that house through the dining room that had already been closed down for the night. All the lights were off. Everything was shut down. I walked through the dark dining room, through the front hallway, through the foyer, into the kitchen and into the pantry. Um, and because microwaves had not been invented yet, um, I was warming some beef stew on the stove for her, and she had asked me to make a short pot of coffee for her. Uh, so I was gone for several minutes while I was doing all of this. Um, and in the interim, um, she was standing on the hearthstone in the parlor, uh, reached into the wood box, grabbed a large uh, log and threw it on the fire. And as she was replacing the screen uh, in front of the fireplace, she heard laughter behind her. And she turned and looked through the portal into the entryway in from the dining from the parlor into the dining room, which was quite large. Um, and she saw an entire family uh, having dinner uh, in the dining room with lights, uh, oil lamps burning, candles burning. Uh, the the center chimney had been sealed shut for more than a hundred years when we bought the house. But there was a woman standing there with a raging fire burning in that chimney, and she was cooking a pot of stew over that fire. And her <laughs> children were running around the room, and the table was not our own. None of the furniture was our own. She said it was all hand-hewn oak, uh, and there were benches, long benches on both sides of the table. And she was telling her children to take their seats at the table so that she could serve dinner. And there were two men sitting on the opposite side of the table, and they both had pewter steins in front of them, which would be indicative of the 1700s because pewter was outlawed, outlawed for dinnerware in the 1800s when they discovered that the lead content was killing people. Um, and so uh, that kind of set in her mind the time period of what she was peering back into uh, which would be mid to late 1700s. And as she's standing there with her mouth agape, watching this family um, having dinner together, one of the two men at the table turned and looked into the parlor and made direct eye contact with her and then nudged the man beside him and pointed her out. And she was the ghost. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's when it made sense to her. <laughs> that <laughs> that was her release. That was oh, her wow. release from the fear when she realized that we were living in a portal that was cleverly disguised as a farmhouse, and that she was looking into the past simultaneously as they were looking into the future, and each was perceiving each other as an interdimensional being from another time. Wow. That's just awesome. Um, I know we're running a little short on time. Um, we'll go over a few more things if it's okay with you. And uh, I do have another question I wanted to ask you. Um, mm -hmm. Miss Sarah White, she wants to know, how do you feel about the Bigfoot theory? Show me a carcass. You know, honestly, I think that if Bigfoot exists, it's an interdimensional being. I think uh, I think that if it was indigenous to this planet, as many people are out looking for it, would have discovered more evidence than we have. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. 
Um, I'm saying that if it does exist, it's probably...